Hey everyone, my name is LJ Stambuk. I'm the presidency of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. And what a beautiful day in, in Charlotte today. Warm, sunny, February 10th. And we have with us our good, good, good friend and someone who's been doing this program annually for the last 12 years, Dr. Jay Bryson, Managing Director and Chief Economist at Wells Fargo, who is going to speak to us today on the Global Economic Outlook 2022. If you have not participated in these programs before with Dr. Jay Bryson, you will understand the economy so much better. He has a way of explaining difficult, difficult, difficult concepts in a way that everyone can understand. And um, I'm just delighted to have this partnership with Wells Fargo and Dr. Jay Bryson for so many years with the World Affairs Council. Uh, it's been a privilege. Jay, I would like to thank our World Affairs Council Charlotte corporate partners. You see them here on the screen. Without them, we would not be able to do what we're doing. And I would also like to use this opportunity to thank our board members who are here in numbers today, World Affairs Council board members who are here with us today. Uh, we have a number of them, Raj Bardwaj, Dr. Claudio Carpano, Millie Cox, Mike Gwynn, Mike Holly, Steve Hunting, Dr. Rikram Kumar, Elizabeth Murphy, Rohan Paul, Firo Spira, Laura Mayer, Wellman, and Hunter Schull with us today. Really appreciate all your leadership and, and making sure that the World Affairs Council is the leading international relations and education organization nonprofit in Charlotte, we have a number of program partners today. I'm delighted to see that we have the World Affairs Council of San Antonio, World Affairs Council, Upstate International, World Affairs Council, Connecticut, Santa Fe Council on International Relations, uh, Milwaukee Institute of World Affairs, uh, University of Wisconsin, and uh, finally, we have WACD with us today. And not to forget, 25, Dr. Bryson, you'll be glad to hear this. We have 25 students from Charlotte Country Day School today participating and learning from you. I'm sure they will have tough questions, but uh, truly uh, a national program today with all our partners from around the country. We also have International House participating, International House of Charlotte. Thank you for being with us. As you know, global education is our passion. As the community's premier global education nonprofit and nonpartisan organization, the World Affairs Council Charlotte believes that everyone deserves access to fact-based and balanced analysis, commentary, and research on critical global issues that affect us all. Dialogue, knowledge, active participation, and an understanding of global issues are vitally important for our democracy to flourish at all levels. Please note a couple of points on how we will do the program today. Your, pro, your microphone will be on mute and your camera will be turned off for the duration of the presentation. There will be a question and answer session and to submit a question anytime, please use the question and answer box in the Zoom toolbar. You can see it circled in red right in the middle. Please do not use the chat. You can communicate with the World Affairs Council Charlotte team through the chat box and we will be updating information as Jay speaks. But for your questions, please do send them to the question and answer box. This presentation will be recorded and we will share it with you through the World Affairs Council Charlotte mailing list. So please make sure that you're signed up and that you're able to receive our emails. Thank you. Wow, we have a lot of programs coming up. Now this program is usually live it's full, it's great, it's, 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 it's just been an amazing program over the years. We were hoping to have it live this year. We were planning to have it live this year. Wells Fargo was kind enough to offer us space to have it live this year. Omicron came in and we're having it for the second year in a row virtually, but it was a great success last year. And, and we hope that it will um, be something that you will talk about. But let me talk to you just for a second about upcoming programs. We have a virtual program, a panel with Tia Young, the director and product manager of 
Carolina Co, Director and Senior Relationship Banker, and Rina Alrin, uh, uh, who is a board member of the World Affairs Council, at Bank of America, and it's going to be uh, on International Women's Day. We will have a World Affairs Council private dinner and national security series with Mark Polymeropoulos, who is the former CIA head of clandestine operations in Europe and Eurasia, and he will speak on clarity in crisis, leadership lessons from the CIA. This will be on May 18th and 19th, 2022, and obviously the International Women's Day panel will be on March 8th. We uh, have on March 1st, the World Affairs Council national security series with Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, retired, who is the former commanding general of US Army Europe. And he will speak on NATO and its seismic challenge. Obviously, we will talk also about Europe and, and, and situation in the Ukraine and on the border there. So this is going to be a live program on March 1. On April 7th, we will have the virtual Euro challenge where our students, including Country Day School, participate in knowledge on the European Union and uh, the winning team gets to go to Washington DC and compete there. Uh, we have on June 7th, the World Citizens Award dinner uh, gala, and we will be honoring Brian Moynihan, the chairman and CEO of Bank of America this year. Finally, uh, well, nearly finally, we have the World Affairs Council Charlotte Travel Advantage trip to Spain and France, and we will go discover the beauty and the romance of the Basque country that's June 10th to June 22nd. And I don't know if you can see this, but let me make sure you do. On September 15, 2022, we have the World Affairs Council Ambassador Circle Series with His Excellency Koji Tomita, Ambassador of Japan to the US, who's going to speak on the US-Japanese economic partnership. And uh, please do check our website and our mailing because we will be adding programs as we get confirmations from other uh, speakers and visitors to Charlotte. If you are on social media, please do follow us, like us, share. Uh, we are very, very present on social media and would like to get your comments and participations uh, as, as you participate um, on social media as well. And thank you for that. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Hunter Schul, board member of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte from Wells Fargo. Hunter. Well, LJ, uh, thank you. And a lot of exciting programs coming up this year, uh, uh, a great year uh, for the World, World Affairs Council. And uh, we're excited, all of us at Wells Fargo are excited uh, to be able to partner here uh, with this organization. And uh, for this um, session with, with, uh, with Jay Bryson, I know as you done this a lot of years and the feedback is uh, that, that Jay's topical comments um, are, are always uh, entertaining and, and this year is no different you know with so many things going on we're looking for what he has to say uh, but just real quickly as as what's seen on the screen um, you know Jay is a graduate of, of U.S. Uh, after a brief uh, time in, in academics uh, he joined Wells Fargo in 1998 and uh, and I think uh, through the years has been a consistent um, thought partner and leader, not only within our company, but with a, a lot of you on the line today. And today as a managing director and our chief economist, um, Jay uh, holds a leadership role within our company. Uh, and and I, um, I will say that, you know, the, the periodic um, opportunities Jay has to be published and to appear on many media outlets um, is a, a great opportunity for our local community. Uh, and I know he's, he's active in a lot of venues and many of you are probably familiar with some of his, his uh, work and commentary. And so Jay, thanks for joining us today. I'll, I'll hand it over to you. I know there probably will be a lot of questions, but we're looking forward to hearing some of your prepared remarks. And so if that's fair, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Well, great, well, thanks Hunter. And thank you for that very, uh, very kind uh, introduction there. I am going to uh, try to share my screen here. Um, Hunter, do you see, do you see that? Yes, I okay. think, we're, I think we're, we're good. We're good, Jay. We can see it. Okay, good. So uh, let me try this. Um, oops. Okay, so, um, right. So what I'm going to talk about today is, 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 you know, kind of the global economic outlook. I'm, I'm really going to focus on just three major economies, the United States, the Eurozone, and China. 
Uh, together, though, those three economies account for about 60% or so of global GDP. So, you know, it's a first approximation of, of the global uh, global economy. But certainly would welcome, you know, questions about other parts of the world if, if, you, if you care to ask those. Now, everything I'm going to talk about here is kind of prefaced by this, this graph right here. This shows you global uh, COVID cases. Um, and, you know, back in January, we peaked at 4 million, um, uh, you know, a day globally, um, starting to come down, um, and, you know, and hopefully this certainly will continue. But, you know, the global economic outlook will depend largely, or in part at least, in, in what's how this evolves, you know, kind of going forward. And, and I think it depends you know, where you sit as well, in terms of the effects on the economy. I mean, for, on the one hand, you know, you have, on one side of the spectrum, you have China. China is essentially taking a zero tolerance policy to this. Whenever cases pop up in certain areas of China, they essentially lock down uh, right away. On the other side of the spectrum, you pretty much have the United States. I mean, we have, I, I think, collectively as a society, have more or less decided we're going to move on uh, now, and, and we will deal with it as, as it comes. Now, you know, clearly, if we get to a point where the public health system in the United States is overwhelmed, you know, if we get another spike of, you know, some sort of new variant or something like that, you know, then maybe there's some restrictions, right? But I don't think we're going to go nationwide uh, sort of restrictions. And then kind of in the middle of between China and the United States, you have Europe, uh, where they have put in restrictions, uh, but not like a zero tolerance policy like they, like they have in China. Uh, so, you know, obviously keep, you know, COVID in mind. Uh, hasn't gone away yet, and, and it potentially could have some effects here on, on the global economic outlook. So let's start with the U.S. So we know that the U.S. in the fourth quarter grew at an annualized rate of about 6.9 percent. And that sounds really, really strong, and, and obviously it is. I would say it overstates the underlying strength of the economy a little bit because a lot of that was due to some, some inventory building. But in general, you know, the economy is, is, is expanding. Now, it looks like it hit a little bit of an air pocket here in the, in the first quarter. And, and we know that when we look at some high frequency data. So here, this is visits to retail and recreation locations. This comes from, uh, from Google. This is where they're tracking people's uh, you know, cell phones and things of that nature. And you, know, you can see that kind of you know, late December, early January, this really came down. And you, know, you could say, okay, well, that's fine. Visits to retail locations always come down in January. But keep in mind, this is, as I'm you know, highlighting here, this is kind of from a baseline. And so this is back in, in 2019. So this is you know, where we are today relative to 2019. I mean, so the point here is it, you know, visits to retail always weakens in January. This January was, it was really weak um, you know, as people kind of avoided you know, COVID. Um, this is coming from Open Table. And, and you know, keep in mind this is daily data, and if you can see my cursor here, I mean, the last observation we have is February the eighth. So this is only last week. So this is very up to date. And again, what you see is people going out to restaurants. You know, kind of weakened back in January. You know, maybe it's turned up a little bit here, but you know, still in general, you know, it came into the first quarter kind of weakish. Um, and then when you look at people passing through airline security here, this is TSA data. Um, you know, if you look at the red line, that's the seven moving, seven day moving average. And again, you see some weakness, you know, kind of, of there. So in general, whereas the economy grew close to 7% annualized um, in the fourth quarter, we're not going to be anywhere close to that um, here in the first quarter. And I'll show you our forecast here in just a minute. But, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's important to keep, you know, the, the forest from the trees here. And that is, you know, when you look at the overall economy in general, when you look at the fundament, underlying fundamentals of the economy, they generally remain pretty strong. And we would expect the economy, although, you know, on a quarter by quarter basis, you're going to get some volatility, we would expect that, you know, the, the economy, this expansion to, to remain in place. And let's just start with looking at balance sheets. So we'll start with the balance sheets of, of, the, of the household sector in the United States. So here I'm showing you household liabilities measured as a percent of you know, disposable income. People refer to this as leverage. And you know, we all know what happened you know, starting at the turn of the century. Americans got really levered up with the housing bubble. But for the last 15 years or so, we've been delevering. Okay, This ratio has come back down. 
And frankly, you know, where we are right now, it's back to where it was before the housing bubble began to inflate. So the balance sheets of the household sector look pretty good. And then when you look at the income statements, um, here what I'm showing you is, is that what's called the household financial obligations ratio. So this is any payment that you are obligated to make on a monthly basis. And again, this is as a percent of, of, of disposable income. So what are, what are financial obligations? So I'll give you some examples. You are obligated to make your mortgage payment every month. That's included. You say, okay, I don't own a home, but I rent. Okay, fine, but you're still obligated to make a monthly lease payment. That's included here. Um, a, a, a car payment's included, student loans included, minimum payment on a credit card included. It's essentially the whole nine yards. And this is measured again as a percent of disposable income. What we're measuring here is the amount of, what we'll call it discretionary income that people have to spend. The lower this ratio goes, the better, the more discretionary income they have. As you can see, I mean, this, this chart only, this time series starts in 1980. Uh, this is the lowest it's been in that 40 year sort of period. So, you know, Hunter mentioned my, uh, some of my background, uh, you know, I was in academia, I, I was a professor of economics at one time. I know how to give letter grades. Uh, this is something I'm sure it's near and dear to the, the, the hearts of the students at, at Charlotte Country Day. Uh, you know, I know how to give letter grades. If I had to give a letter grade to the financial position of the household sector today, it's a solid B, it's probably a B plus. Um, and whereas 20 years ago, it was a C minus moving to a D. Um, so, you know, we've really cleaned up our financial act. When you look at the business sector, not quite as good news there, but still it's generally okay. Here is business sector debt measured as a percent of GDP. So the blue area here would be the debt of the corporate sector. And then stacked on top of that would be the debt of the non-corporate sector, you know, partnerships and proprietorships in general. The total area would be the total business debt. And whereas, to go back, just to refresh your memory, whereas the household sector has delevered for the last 15 years, the business sector has actually levered up. Now, is this an issue? It's an issue if they can't service their debt. And so in order to try to get a sense of whether they can service their debt, we look at this next chart, which is called the interest coverage ratio. So this is essentially the amount of cash flow that businesses have to cover their interest and amortization payments. The higher this ratio goes, the better, the more cash flow they have. Uh, this series only goes back to 1983, but here, you can see that's at an all time high. So businesses, have they levered up? Yes. Do they have a fair amount of debt? Yes. Can they service the debt? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I don't wait, lay, at night at work, lay at night right now worrying about the uh, financial position of, of the business sector, at least not right now. So again, the underlying fundamentals of the overall economy remain pretty strong. And so when we look at our forecast for going forward for GDP, you know, again, this last blue bar was the fourth quarter. We grew up sequentially closely seven, close to 7% annualized. Um, here in the first quarter, you know, it's pretty much stall speed. Uh, we don't have a negative number there, although I could see you could potentially get a, you know, a small negative number here in the first quarter. It doesn't mean we're back in recession. Um, it just means it's one quarter of some modestly negative sort of growth. But again, that's not our forecast at this point, but you know, we only have it growing 1%, uh, which is more or less you know, um, you know, stall speed. But we think as we go forward, given the, given the underlying good fundamentals of the economy, that you know, the economy will continue to grow. Although, as you can see, the height of these bars gets smaller as we go forward. No more 7%, and that frankly is an unsustainable sort of pace. You know, these numbers kind of get smaller. We start to move back towards trend growth as we go forward. All right, now what about this, right? This is on everyone's mind right now, uh, CPI inflation. Um, some of us uh, on, this, on this call, I'm not gonna name names, you know who you are. Some of us remember double digit inflation. 
Um, that's getting to be a smaller and smaller um, proportion of us uh, because you have to go back, uh, you know, 30 years or more, 40 years really, to see that. Uh, the numbers that printed this morning, um, and this chart reflects those numbers on a year-over-year -year basis, the overall rate of CPI inflation, 7.5%. The so-called core, when you strip out energy and food, um, is at 6%. You know, again, you would have to really go back to 1982. Um, and and you know, many people on this call um, were not even born in 1982. So the highest we've seen in, in you know, at least a generation or two. Uh, what's going on here, and is this going to get worse uh, from here? All right, this next chart now kind of drills down, and it shows us where the inflation's coming from. So if you look at the line, um, the line is going to show you that 7.5% inflation rate. And then these stacked bars show you where it's coming from, the broad categories. So let's start down here, this gray area. Um, a little bit more of, of two percentage points of the seven and a half, you know, is coming from what we'll call core service. It's coming from the service part of the economy. This next bar, this dark blue, it's, you know, it's, what is this? Um, call it uh, two and a half or some more percentage points is coming from core goods. Uh, this kind of lavender is coming from food. And then this red stuff is coming from energy. What's, in, what's interesting here is if you look at these top three, uh, these would largely be categorized as goods, you know, core goods, food, and energy. So the point here is two thirds of the inflation rate is coming from the goods sector. What's interesting is when you look at what we spend our money on, only a third of what we spend our money on is goods. Goods are producing, are punching well above their fighting weight in terms of inflation right now. And that makes sense. If you go back to the pandemic, uh, when it first started, what really closed down? It was the service sector, right? You couldn't go to restaurants, people weren't traveling, things of that nature. People had a lot of income because of the different stimulus programs. So what did they do? They went out and they bought goods, okay? And when you think again of goods, that's where the supply constraints have, have come in, um, you know, in the economy. So if you think back to your principles of economics, and I'm uh, Char um, Charlotte Country Day students, this question is directed at you, those of you folks who are taking economics, what happens when supply gets constrained and demand goes up? Now, I know the, short, the students at Charlotte Country Day know the answer to that. Some of you other folks may not know the answer, so I'll tell you. When supply goes down and demand goes up, prices go up. And so that's why you're seeing all this demand, all these price pressures out of the goods part of the economy. The good news here as we go forward is demand is decelerating, right? We don't have a lot of more stimulus in the, in the, the pipeline. Those checks that got sent out have either been saved or they've been, they've been spent already. So demand is decelerating and the supply constraints are starting to ease up. So what happens when, when demand slows down and supply increases, price pressures start to come down. That's the good news, all right? The bad news though, is when you look at this service stuff, this continues to increase. And you know the biggest part of the service, the cost of the service providers is wages and salaries. And when you look at wages, you can see what's happening here. We are getting acceleration there in wages. What's going to happen going forward there depends on this next chart. And this is inflation expectations. This is, this is key to thinking about what's going to happen to inflation going forward. A big part of the actual rate of inflation is determined by what people think is going to happen to inflation. So if you think the price of something is going to be 20% higher a year from now than it is today, you have a real incentive to go out and buy that good or that service today. And if everyone's doing that, that pushes the prices up today. Also, if you think that prices are gonna be significantly higher going forward, you have a real incentive to ask for higher wages going forward. 
you know, the, the, the good news of this chart is the, what's more important, this is the one year ahead inflation with people expect a year ahead. And you can see that's kind of come up um, and that can kind of be volatile. What's a little bit more important is this red line. This is the long-term inflation expectations where people think inflation is going to be, you know, five to 10 years in the future. That's trended up, but it hasn't spiked up yet. And so this is key to figuring out what's going to happen to inflation as we go forward. We're keeping a real eye, close eye on this inflation expectations. And so far, it hasn't become unmoored, at least not to this point. When we look at our inflation forecast going forward, we think we're pretty much at the peak right now, 7.5%. We probably have another month or two of 7% sort of numbers. And then we think this starts to recede. And when you look at this, you say, oh, well, that's, that's good. We go back to 2%. Okay, yeah, but we're back at 2% at the end of next year. You know, when, it, when we look at our forecast, at the, which is the end of this year is kind of right around where my pointer is right now. The end of this year, we think the headline rate of inflation will be somewhere around 4%. And we think the core rate of inflation will be roughly 4.5%. That's a high inflation rate. So although we do believe inflation's not going to stay at 7%, we think it's going to recede, what I would say is I think that inflation is going to be elevated this year, at least relative to where we've been over the last decade or two. And what that means is the Fed is getting ready to hike rates. It's very likely, unless the economy just completely comes off the rails between now and uh, a month from now, when the next FOMC meeting is, or something just out of the extraordinary happens. Unless that, unless that one of those events happens, the Fed's gonna be hiking rates. And so we look for them to hike rates by 25 basis points in March, May, and June each. So by the summer, we think rates will be 75 basis points higher. This summer, we think they'll start to wind down their balance sheet, start to let it shrink. That's a form of, of tightening. And then by the end of the year, we're looking for two more rate hikes. So over the course of this year, we're looking for the Fed to hike rates by 175 basis points and be winding down or, or letting their balance sheet start to shrink. And as we look into next year, we think they're going to be going by another 75 basis points as well. What they're trying to do here is they're trying to keep these inflation expectations from becoming unmoored. What they're trying to say to them to the public is, we're on top of it. You know, don't worry about 1979. This is not 1979. We're going to be tightening here. We're going to make sure inflation does not get out of control. That's what all this tightening um, is all about at the end of the day. Um, let me switch gears here, quickly move, to talk about the Eurozone. I'm looking at the purchasing managers indices here, one for the service sector, which is the red, one for the manufacturing sector, which is the blue, the way these things work is when you're above 50, um, activity in that sector tends to be expanding. When you're below 50, it tends to be contracting. What you see is the service sector has weakened. Now it's still expanding by this measure, but it has weakened and that's what makes sense. That's where the restrictions in Europe were, uh, you know, in terms of restaurants and, and things of that nature. You know, when we look at our GDP forecast for Europe, um, you know, last year, 2021 was a pretty good year, a very good year in terms of growth, albeit coming off a low base. You know, we're looking for growth on the order of, let's call it three and a half percent or so in the Eurozone this year, followed by roughly 2% next year. So we do believe growth will be, um, you know, remaining solid in the Eurozone. They too have an inflation issue, but not quite as bad as, all, as we do. Um, we had a lot more fiscal stimulus here than what they did in Europe. If you look at the overall rate of inflation right now in Europe, it's about 5%. That's the highest it's been in decades um, in the Eurozone. The core rate, which is, you know, it excludes food and energy, but still comprises you know, 80% of what people are spending their money on. And you can see that's a little bit more subdued. That's roughly 2.5%. But you know, that, again, that's above the ECB's target right now. So we expect the ECB, like the Fed, uh, to, be, uh, to be tightening. Uh, right now, they continue to purchase bonds. This is the size of the ECB's balance sheet. We think that they are going to be slowing that pace pretty significantly going forward, and we think they'll stop purchasing altogether in September of this year. 
Um, and then at that point, we believe that they will start to hike rates. Their main, inter their main policy rate is what's called their central bank deposit rate. That's actually in negative territory right now. It actually has been in negative territory for years. Uh, we think they will hike by 25 basis points uh, at the end of this year, early next year. We think they'll uh, hike again. That will bring the deposit rate to zero. And then as you can see, uh, further rate hikes out of the ECB um, ne next year as well. And so just in general, when you look around the world, here I'm showing you two-year government bond yields. Um, the blue is the United States, the, the red is the United Kingdom, and then here is Germany. Everyone's come up pretty significantly lately. And this does not include uh, this morning's uh, uh, look, which, um, well, actually it does. Um, today, uh, look at that. We updated it this morning, February the 10th. Uh, the two-year yield was up, last time I looked at it, about 10 basis points uh, this morning uh, because of that uh, CPI print that we got. Um, and then finally, when we look at China here, uh, you know, China is growing on year-over-year -year terms, although, you know, we, China has been decelerating for years, and we think it's going to continue uh, to decelerate as well. You know, positive growth in China, to be sure. You know, year-over-year -year rates of 5% or so, but certainly not double digits like we saw last decade or even high single digits as we saw just a few years ago. Uh, this has been decelerating for a while and I'll get back to that in just a second. Um, in terms of inflation, not a whole heck of a lot of inflation there um, in China right now, inflation rates on the order of 2% um, or below. Um, but you know, when I look further out and I think of China, uh, I, haven't, I haven't mentioned this word up until now. I haven't used the word Japan yet, but I'll use it right now. When I think of China, I think of Japan in many respects. Um, you know, you go back and you look at Japan 30 years ago, you know, clearly the, the financial bubbles there blew up. The, the Japanese economy never imploded, but the Japanese economy more or less stalled. Um, and it has stalled for the last 30 years or so. Uh, part of the problem there in, China, in, China, in Japan was debt you know, back in the 80s um, and also the demographics. You look at China today and they have two of the very similar sort of qualities. I talked about business debt in the United States earlier. Um, here I'm looking at the United States, this is the red line versus business debt in China. Their ratio is double ours. The Chinese, business sector is very indebted right now. And for those of you who follow China a little bit more or closely, I mean, you know about the problem, the debt problems in the, in the real estate sector there, particularly, you know, they use the word Evergrande, you know, the large property developer there that has significant amount of, of debt. They've got a real debt issue, at least in the, in the, in the business sector there in China. Um, and then when I look at the demographics in China, that's not very good as well. I mean, here's the blue line. This is the overall population in China. Um, right now, it's about 1.4 billion people, and that's going to continue to rise over the next few years. But all these people are getting older. Here's the working age population. That's defined as people between 50, 15 and 64. That topped out a few years ago. Um, that's actually going down. And you can see, the, so this, these are projections from the UN um, they go out through mid-century, just like in Japan, which you know, the, ja the Japanese population is actually declining right now. That's not happening in China, but the working age population, which determines economic growth, is declining. And so, you know, if I go back here, yeah, China's growing five, four or five percent right now, um, and probably will for the next few years. But as I, if I were to draw this line forward, I think this red line continues to come down. I think five years from now, China will be lucky to grow 4%, um, you know, given what's going on in terms of the underlying, the, debt, the business debt and the, the, the debt overall. Uh, just wrapping it up here, when I think of global GDP, you know, in general, um, you know, what we're looking for here is just kind of a deceleration. Um, you know, last year, so this is 2021, this red bar here. I consider it, it's still a forecast because we don't hard, have hard numbers yet. But you know the estimates are it's going to grow, you know high fives. But you know that's coming from a you know very depressed base. 
This year, we look for it to grow roughly 4%, which is a good number. This red line going across this lot chart here, that's the long-term average. So this year should be above long-term average, but next year we think will be, let's call it roughly average um, next year. Um, you know, no great guns um, because of, you know, some of this monetary tightening that's going on in the world uh, will lead to slower growth. And then you have, you know, the slower population growth of the places of China and places like that, which we think will add some, uh, some headwinds to, uh, to growth. So, um, you know, Rohan, I think I'm going to stop right there. Um, I, uh, I just want to give people, you know, plenty of time to, to ask some questions here. So let me just stop there. And uh, Rohan, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, see if there's Great. any uh, any questions. Fantastic. Um, Jay, we do have a number of questions and I'll maybe just kick it off first. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Very illuminating. Um, you know, uh, I think oh, I should put this video on. Yeah. Um, a, a couple of things to start is, um, have we actually seen um, both a tightening of um, the balance sheet of the Fed and rising interest rates at the same time when we appear to be so far behind the curve on inflation? Um, and and uh, allied with that is, Sometimes you read that there's a lot of zombie companies out there that, but for low interest rates, would not be able to service their debt obligations. So, sort of a combo question. Yeah. All right. So let's start with the first one, and and really we only have one observation, mm -hmm. um, and the observation there is of the Fed is um, the last cycle. I mean, they, before that they had never expanded their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the last cycle, they started to, so they paused buying bonds um, in late 2014. They didn't start hiking rates until 2015, um, but they kept the, the size of the balance sheet the same. Um, and then they started to shrink their balance sheet in 2017. At roughly the same time, they were hiking rates at that time. Um, that really didn't cause a huge dislocation in economic growth in the United States. But they were, they were raising rates relatively slowly back then, and they were shrinking the balance sheet at, at a relatively slow pace. I think this time around, you're going to see them hiking rights faster than they did last time. And you'll, I think you'll see them shrinking the balance sheet faster as well. And so the point here is we've got a significant amount of tightening that's coming at us. And, um, you know, again, I'm not at the point that I'm going to say the Fed's going to slam on the brakes too quickly and, and put us into a recession. But there's that risk, right? If you were to say, what's the one of the major risks to your forecast later this year and early next year, the, one of the major risks would be the Fed does, in fact, move too fast. You know, monetary policy acts with only a long lag. And... They won't see it in the data until a number of months, and they potentially could slam on the brakes a little bit too fast. So that's a major, you know, potential risk to the forecast. Yeah. You talk about zombie companies, and you know, et cetera, except for low interest rates and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you look at, uh, so if they start to raise rates next uh, month, as we expect them to do. Are companies going to see that right off the bat? The answer is no, not right off the bat. Um, or at least they'll see it on the margin. Because if you look at the structure of business debt, 75% of business debt is fixed rate. Now, how long is it fixed for? I don't know. I don't have the visibility on that. But fixed rate would be anything that's fixed for more than one year. So... You know, so those of you folks who have a mortgage can think about it this way. You know, if the Fed hikes rates next month and you've got a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, you're thinking to yourself, so what? Right. My mortgage stays the same. And for any business that has you know, a fixed rate debt, they're not going to see it right away. It's only over time. And so you know, but a lot of it's really going to depend on how high rates go and things of that nature. You know, I don't. You know, I, as I said earlier, I don't lay awake at night worrying about business debt at this point. But ask me that question another year or two, um, depending on how much rates come up, my answer could be different, you know, at that, at that point. 
So I have two related questions. Um, uh, one from uh, Mike Mazzola, which is, um, might the Biden administration uh, try to pressure the Fed to slow down uh, the tightening just in case it might impact their chances of uh, re-election and, and doing well in the midterms? And the second question is, we're having two new um, uh, Federal Reserve members who uh, have specialized in studies related to poverty and uh, the impact of various policies on, on minorities. Um, might that change how the Fed thinks about the economy and its impact uh, on the US population or, or not? So in terms of the first one, the Biden administration could, you know, President Biden could call up uh, Chairman Powell and say, hey, I don't want you guys to be raising rates um, here. Uh, Chairman Powell can tell him to jump in a lake. Um, Chairman Powell does not report directly to the president. Um, you know, he, he's, uh, he, he's independent, you know, he, he was, he was um, uh, appointed by President Trump initially. He's been, you know, reappointed by uh, President Biden. He's widely expected he's going to be confirmed by the Senate and Biden really can't touch him or the rest of the FOMC sort of members. Now, um, you know, the, um, the Federal Reserve was created by an act of Congress in 1913. It could be changed by an act of Congress, but, um, you know, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't take the marching orders from, from uh, the, the administration or from Congress on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, reading what I'm reading from the Fed, even the most dovish members think they should be hiking rates right now. Um, in terms of the second question, in terms of, of uh, new appointments, so the president um, has ne recently nominated three people to join the Federal Reserve Board. Um, that's, they recently had a confirmation hearing um, on, on the Hill, um, and we'll see if they get through or not. Um, knowing what I know about those people, I would say they would tend everything else equal to be a, a little bit more on the dovish side. Um, you know, the Fed has been paying more attention, and, and they did this in the last cycle, about um, they, they actually let the economy kind of run hot to allow labor market, people who um, have not experienced good labor market growth in the past, for them for that to happen. And by the end of the last cycle, as an example, if you look at the unemployment rate among Black and African American individuals, it went down to the lowest rate has been, you know, at least in 50 years we've Kept that uh, we've kept that data, uh, so I would think everything else equal. These three members would tend to be a little bit more on the dovish side, uh, mm -hmm. not wanting to hike rates, you know, significantly. Uh, but uh, but but I would also say that some of the people who've rotated on into the voting membership of the board or uh, of the FOMC this year are a little bit more on the hawkish side. So that kind of balances that out, you know, kind of at least for this year. So you know, again. Um, unless the economy just were to come to a complete standstill or something like that, I think you're looking at rate hikes this year. The only question is by how much. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Quantadon Light had a question around uh, business sector debt, but I think you've answered part of that question in terms of it's not a big issue for you now. However, what about the China business debt and could that end up being something that could blow up uh, uh, the, the global economy is that a risk yeah. that we need to be concerned about? Right. So you know, if you're uh, you know, if you say uh, Rohan, if you say the word China to me, and then say now think, tell me the first ten words that pop to your mind. Um, transparent would probably not be one of those words. Um, the transparency of the business sector debt in China, it's it's well, it's opaque at best. Um, so I think it's I think it's a risk. You know, so I, uh, one of the risks to the global outlook, in my view. Uh, would be um, excessive monetary tightening, not only by the Fed, but by other major central banks. The other potential uh, risk here would be business sector debt in China. You know, if China were to have a debt crisis, not our forecast, but there's a risk in that. If China were to have a debt crisis, um, it's the second largest economy in the world. The second largest economy in the world has some issues. That's going to affect everybody. Um, now, is it another Lehman Brothers? Is it another global financial crisis? I am, I don't know if you can hear this, I'm knocking on wood right now. Um, I, I don't think that it is because, you know, if you go back 10, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, debt, U.S. debt 
whether it was government debt, whether it was mortgage debt, whether it was corporate debt, was held widely around the world. And so when our mortgages blew up uh, with the housing bubble, um, the, the, um, you know, the, the mortgage-backed securities that European banks had, the values that went to zero, and Asian banks, et cetera. And so that, you know, that created credit crunches all around the world. The vast majority, and I mean the vast majority of debt, uh, Chinese debt is held in China. American mm-hmm. banks own very little Chinese debt. European banks own very little Chinese debt. Okay. And so if the second largest economy in the world blows up, that's, that economically, that's going to have an effect. It's, it's going to exert a big slung effect on the economy. Is it another global financial crisis? Again, knocking on wood here. I don't think so. Just when I look at who owns that debt. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, Chase Saunders had some questions around food inflation in terms of how bad it could get. And uh, I know it's a component of the CPI, uh, but how long it would last. And he had, the specific reference was to the Belarus potash export restrictions, which is 20% of global production. And could that mean uh, we can't grow as much as uh, we want? Um, and an anti-petroleum uh, bias against affordable U.S. fertilizer production. Is that something that concerns you um, greatly or any commentary there? So, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of the inflation part of that, I would say that would be mar- marginal in terms of an inflation, right? Um, so if you look at, um, you know, you would think, so when people think about inflation, they always think in terms of food and gasoline, because that's what they see all the time. Um, Every week you're buying gasoline, every week you're buying food. Those two components though, believe it or not, are a relatively small part of overall inflation. Food and energy combined, and this is all energy, this isn't just gasoline, this is all energy. It's only about 18% of the CPI, 82% is not related to that. The biggest part is actually services. And the biggest individual part is actually housing. And people don't think about housing um, here, um, but you know, the biggest part, and this isn't the way the CPI numbers are actually calculated, but this is a close approximation. I used the, the example of having a fixed rate mortgage before. Um, you know, that's the biggest part of what mo- most people spend their money on every month. If you have a fixed rate mortgage, how much does your mortgage payment go up every month? Zero, right? So the point here is, is could wheat prices and whatever accelerate dramatically from here? Yes. Is that gonna have a big effect on, on um, inflation? Probably not. Now, I'm gonna take a broader view here, okay? And, you know, you talk about Belarus and Ukraine and Russia, and, I'm, and you know, if nothing else, I'm trying to head off some questions here. What happens if that all goes south? Well, the answer is we don't really know. It depends on how south it goes, right? You know, if we, since we've been sitting here, if Russian tanks are, are rolling into the Ukraine, mm-hmm. um, I would guess, I'm not looking at my screen right now, but I would guess that would have a big a negative effect on the stock market um, because of the uncertainty. And then it depends on what happens, right? I'm sure we're going to put sanctions on Russia. They probably are going to retaliate themselves. They, maybe they cut off the gas to Western Europe. Um, and that would be a real slowing effect on the German economy. And, you know, so if, if you look at the exports that we send to Russia, it's only $6 billion. I get $6 billion is a big number, but in the context of a $23 trillion economy, it's a rounding error. All right, but now you start to say, okay, Europe has a big problems because they can't get gas and things of that nature. Now you're starting to get bigger and bigger sort of effects. So, Wheat from Ukraine and Belarus and et cetera, et cetera, a big impact on the U.S. economy, no. But more broadly, you know, a Russian-Ukraine crisis or war, it's starting to get a little bit bigger. So when I when look at the forecast that you just gave us, this is under the assumption that it's a status quo on those risks, uh, whether correct. it's China, Ukraine, more inflation. That's correct. The underlying, the underlying assumptions here not that this is necessarily a good assumption. The underlying assumption here is A, China doesn't blow up, and B, um, you don't get to a shooting war with Ukraine and Russia, right? Mm-hmm. If that changes, 
uh, as John Maynard Keynes once said, when the facts change, they change my mind. Um, so that's the underlying assumption. Yeah. Um, uh, Puneet had asked a question about how is growth going to get impacted by the labor market situation? Do you see that tempering it to some extent or what's your general view there? So short term, you know, I kind of showed you a chart before in terms of wage um, acceleration, what's going on there. So if, if the labor market remains really tight, you could put, and, and I'm going to add this as well, this is very important because I talked about it, and inflation expectations really start to take off, then you start to see wages really start to accelerate, and then you potentially could be in a wage price spiral. Um, the good news is what we are seeing is the labor force participation rate starting to come back up again. Um, and as more and more people start to come back into the labor force, we think that will probably start to put some headwinds on upward momentum in terms of wages. <coughs> Excuse me, further out, though, in terms of the, the you know, long-term sort of forecast, let's face it, I mean, we, you know, we as a society are getting older. You know, if you look at what's happened since the pandemic, if you look at labor force participation, among different cohorts, um, everybody, participation from everybody came down right when the economy shut down. A lot of people you know, in cohorts have come back. What hasn't come back is the 55 to 64 year old group. And that's probably not coming back. Not most, of those folk, most of those folks are probably retired and they're done, they're gone, right? And you know, we as a society are, we're just getting older. And so if, um, and so when you look at what's going to drive the labor force in the years to come, it's two things. You know, one would be um, just the underlying demographics. And, you know, even if we start to have a lot of babies tomorrow, that's not going to help us unless we change the child labor laws dramatically in this country. That, that's not going to help us for another 15 to 20 years. And the other thing is, you know, you could solve the labor problem through lots of immigration. Uh, call me a skeptic, but, but I don't see that happening anytime soon either. So the point here is labor force growth for the foreseeable future is going to remain slow. And we had a question about that uh, on China as well. I mean, what can they do to stem the demographic decline? This one child policy obviously been an issue, but are they long past that in your judgment? I think they're long past that. I mean, they've tried, they're trying. You know, they got rid of the one child policy three or four years ago. We haven't seen any movement in terms of the overall birth rate there. Um, so that what's what's the other what you know how uh, one thing would be maybe um, just having people work longer there, um, mm -hmm. you know maybe uh, you cut back on pensions and that forces people back into the labor force. Um, another thing would be lots of immigration. Um, you know the problem with China is it's not the most immigrant friendly you know sort of place. Um, I mean it's just it's difficult. You know, it, the good thing about the United States is we speak English, um, and you know I'm not trying to be nationalistic or anything like that, but English is the lingua franca of the, you know, everybody speaks English around the world, right? It's easy, you know, it's relatively easy if you speak English to come here and work, if you can get a visa, et cetera, right? Uh, you go to China, you got to speak Chinese and, you know, that's a, that's a heavy lift, right? So I, I think they've got limited policy options there in terms yeah. of the, the demographic outlook. Thank you. Um, from uh, Charlotte Country Day, I'll just read you the question. Based on the economic roller coaster we've been on over the last two years, what government policies provided the most significant protections to the overall economy? And then what additional protections do, do you wish were in place? So, you know, I think when I look back to March of 2020, I give, I give Congress high marks for acting as quickly as they did with the CARES Act. The CARES Act provided a bridge to get the economy over the valley of the two months that it was locked down. Mm -hmm. um, gave people lots of income. And so I, I think that was, that's really, uh, that was really important um, in keeping the economy afloat. Now, mm -hmm. reasonable people, I think, can disagree on whether we needed the stimulus program, the small stimulus program that we had at the end of 2020, um, and then the, um, the American Rescue Plan, the you know, one, mm -hmm. one eight trillion dollar plan that was put in place um, last year at this roughly this time. 
Um, that was a lot of short-term stimulus and things of that nature. So knowing what I know today, and, and if I were the czar um, and, and could rearrange things, I think you know maybe I would go light, lighter on the American Rescue Plan. Maybe I would go lighter on sending out all those checks that got sent mm -hmm. out to people who in many cases didn't really need them and they just went out and spent them on whatever. Um, but I think what's important, what I do applaud, what I do think is important is the American Jobs Plan, the hard infrastructure plan that was passed. Um, you know, th this country has failing grade, or not failing, but you know, Ds in terms of infrastructure. We vastly, we really need infrastructure. And so if I could redo it all over again, I would take a lot of the money that went from the American Rescue Plan, sending out checks to people to spend, put that money into even more infrastructure um, here in the economy, because I think that that grows the long run capacity and the long run productivity of, of the economy. All right. um, we've got a couple more. Uh, there's a lot more questions that I'm going to have to just choose a couple. A uh, follow on to what you just said, Dennis Applier asked whether the Build Back Better program actually could reduce inflation. Because uh, well, I know there's been a debate on that. Well, let me right. say let me say a, a big hi to to, uh, to Denny, Professor Appleyard. He was one of my dissertation advisors back in Chapel Hill back in the day. And uh, it, I've had a really great relationship with him you know, over all these years. Could Build Back Better, um, which is, we'll call it the soft infrastructure program, could that reduce inflation in the long term? Yeah, that, you know, uh, Denny, I, I think that is, um, that potentially could have some productivity enhancing or, or supply side enhancing things in it. Uh, you know, to the extent that you have better childcare, it lets um, caregivers potentially come into the labor force. It would expand the labor force there. So um, there are potentially some, I talked about hard infrastructure, but some of these things in the Build Back Better program, um, some on the softer side of things, I think potentially could have some supply side um, positive externalities to them. That said, our thought, on, I would give the Build Back Better program the chance of passage one in three. Um, at this point. I just don't think it's going to happen. Okay, so the last question uh, comes from Frederick Grisset, although there are many more, uh, and this is, um, should we worry about China's ability to continue to fund large purchases of U.S. treasuries in the event that China's domestic debt problems, uh, you know, put some pressure against being able to do that? Yep, another shout out to Frederick, uh, another old colleague of mine here at, at Wells Fargo. Um, so um, should we be worried about that? So if you look at uh, how much of, of uh, how much of treasuries China holds today, it's roughly about 7% or so. It's a relatively small number. Smaller. Um, you know, at one time it was bigger, but what's happened is uh, China hasn't bought nearly as many treasury securities over the years than many other individuals have. Um, you know, if China were to just completely dump its trillion dollar or so portfolio, of, of treasury securities, I don't expect that to happen, but if that were to happen, that would lead to a dislocation in the treasury market. But I would also, uh, but you know, and, and you could see the you know, yields snap higher, but, uh, or prices go low, you know, prices of treasuries would go lower, conversely. Uh, as soon as prices go lower, there's a wall of money out there waiting to buy it. Okay. And so the Chinas of the world wouldn't buy it, but the Singapore's, the Taiwan's, the the uh, pension funds in the United States would all be lining up ready to buy. So I don't really worry about significantly. Excellent. Jake, thank you very, very much. There are a whole host that we could go on for another 30, 40 minutes. So, but I'm going to turn it back over to LG. Thank you very, very much. Very enlightening presentation. Thank you, Rohan. This was fantastic. Uh, Dr. Bryson has always uh, learned a lot. It's a pleasure to hear. It's a pleasure to learn from you. And it's a pleasure to talk to you uh, during the question and answer session. Uh, to get our uh, members and, and uh, uh, attendees to this program involved. I do want to use this moment to uh, give a shout out to Dr. David Calloway, who is a board member from Atrium Health, who is working extremely hard during these pandemic times, who found time to join us as well. And thank you, David, for being with us. Dr. Bryson, I'm looking forward to next year, next February, and to a live event with you. Thank you so very much and Wells Fargo uh, for doing all you're doing and for supporting the work of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. Having said that, I'm turning it over to Michael Hawley, Ken L. Gates, board member of the World Affairs Council, former chair of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. Mike.
Can hear you, Mike. Cannot hear you. Uh oh. Um, I guess we didn't hear Mike too well, so I, I will try to reconstruct what Mike said, and he basically said, "Fantastic, great, Jay." Thank you so very much. Uh, you always do such a fantastic job. To those that are members of the World Affairs Council, thank you for your support. And to those who are not, please do join us, support us, because without your help and participation, we would not be able to have these great programs. So thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you, Dr. Jay Bryson. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Rohan. And thank you, Hunter. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye.